Hello, this lecture for marine ecology is going to be the final in our series of lectures about the food chain, which began with primary production, which is the creation of organic matter. Then we talked about secondary production of organic, uh, secondary production, which is the process by which heterotrophs move organic matter into different forms as it's transferred up the food chain. And now we're talking about microbial ecology, which is going to uh, bring it back to the beginning and talk about how organic matter is uh, remineralized or turned back into the raw ingredients of primary production by microbes. And we'll talk about some other microbially mediated processes that are important in the oceans. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the ways that uh, chemistry interacts with microbiology in the oceans in ways that are important to the cycles of life known as biogeochemical cycles. So um, we'll, we'll talk about what microbes are first, and we'll, we'll cover some of the basics of microbial ecology, which is just you know regular ecology, population, community, and ecosystem level processes, but focused on microorganisms. Uh, and then we'll talk about marine chemistry in relationship with uh, the ecological processes. Um, some of the concepts we'll introduce are the red field ratio, uh, which relates to the idea of nutrient limitation, which nutrients are the limiting factor for life. Uh, and then we'll talk about carbon in the ocean and its different forms and how that affects ocean chemistry. So microbes are microscopic organisms. It's just an, another word for microscopic organisms. And um, they're defined by the fact that they're small, they're microscopic, and they're actually extremely diverse. So all three of the domains of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, are all included in the microbes, or all have some uh, members that are microorganisms. So um, there's a wide evolutionary diversity within the microbes. In addition to the wide evolutionary diversity within the microbes, there is a wide diversity of lifestyles or ways of getting energy and food, which we call trophic modes. So the, the two basic trophic modes are autotrophy and heterotrophy. Autotrophy is where the organisms are creating organic matter out of inorganic materials and said to be sort of making their own food. Autotrophy means self-feeding. So plants are autotrophs. And of course, there are microscopic plant-like organisms in the ocean. Those include phytoplankton, which are microscopic autotrophs that drift in the water. Um, there's benthic microalgae, which are microscopic autotrophs that are uh, down on the bottom, like a layer of green scum on the mud. And then there are chemosynthetic autotrophs as well, which live in parts of the ocean uh, that, that may not have so much light, such as underneath the sediments or in the, the deep ocean. And instead of using light as their energy source for creating organic matter, they use uh, energy rich in organic molecules as their energy source. Um, so that's autotrophy in the microbial world. There's also heterotrophy. And so heterotrophy means you're uh, not making organic matter from nothing, you uh, from inorganic matter, you're making organic matter from existing organic matter that you consume or, or break down through decomposition. So microzooplankton, microscopic zooplankton that uh, eat other even smaller zooplankton would be uh, heterotrophic microbes. Decomposers that break down organic material are also considered heterotrophs. And there's a variety of pathogens, which is another word for germs, uh, and, and symbionts, so microorganisms that live in or on other organisms um, as, as parasites or, or commensal um, uh, symbiotes would be heterotrophic as well. So what makes microbes special? The, the fact that they're small is associated with some other special abilities that uh, allow them to do things that larger organisms can't do, or at least can't do so efficiently. So being small gives microbes the high surface area to volume ratio. We talked about that in the primary production lecture, how um, size and shape affect an organism's surface area to volume ratio, and particularly for organisms that need to directly absorb materials from the water or uh, give, give 
or release materials from their bodies back into the water, having a lot of surface area in touch with the water is really important for allowing them to do that. So uh, microorganisms have a very high surface area to volume ratio. It's easy for them to transport materials into and out of their cells, even without complex organ systems or anything like that. Uh, and this gives them the ability to grow and process materials rapidly. So they have a, a high production to biomass ratio. They're able to you know, double their populations in hours rather than needing years to do that for example. Um, so that allows them to sort of respond rapidly to whatever the conditions are in the environment. Another uh, amazing thing about the microbial world as a whole is that it's incredibly diverse. So all these different species of microbes have different abilities to use different types of uh, chemicals in the environment to survive different conditions in the environment. Uh, so just about for any occasion, any combinations of salinity, temperature, resource availability, there's, there's a microbe that can flourish in that environment. Um, and so, so microbes are sort of everywhere doing everything all the time. And uh, for any sort of important chemical transformation in the environment, uh, there's there's usually a microbe that sort of helps mediate that chemical transmission transformation, like uh, the conversion of ammonia to nitrate, which is called chemolithotrophic nitrification. That is carried out by uh, chemosynthetic microbes that uh, do that as a way of getting energy. So uh, a lot of these important conversions in the environment from one chemical form to another chemical form are sort of carried out by microbes in a way that um, is part of the microbes lifestyle and how they make a living. Um, speaking of microbial lifestyles, there's there's a wide variation. So some microbes are uh, very fast reproducing and they're able to uh, take advantage of abundant resources and bloom in abundance really rapidly. Uh, those are called R ecotypes. And that lowercase r is derived from the exponential population growth equation and refers to sort of like the maximum pop potential population growth rate of the organism in an environment that has plenty of resources. So an environment with plenty of resources, like all of a sudden there's a carcass there that needs to be decomposed. Uh, those R ecotypes would uh, rapidly colonize that and, and uh, quickly reproduce and consume that organic material. Um, on the other hand, um, there, there's also sort of a role in the environment for microbes that can get by uh, with very scarce resources and in very sort of uh, harsh harsh conditions, and those are the K ecotypes. That refers to the carrying capacity term of the logistic population growth equation. The idea being that if you're in an environment where there's very little resources left, uh, you need to be sort of good at biding your time and taking advantage of whatever little resources there are, uh, maybe even going through long periods of uh, not having any food or, or resources available to you at all. Uh, and some microbes are adapted to, to the, those kind of conditions. Something that helps those microbes deal with living in sort of resource poor environments or environments that are not always suitable for life is that uh, microbes have modes of life between dead and alive. So they, they won't be like actively, um, their cells won't be actively functioning, but they won't exactly be dead either. They're just sort of waiting for the conditions where they can start to feed and grow again. So some of them can kind of form cysts to protect themselves and then just depending on some chemical or, or physical cue from the environment that indicates that conditions are good again, they'll sort of come back to life and um, begin functioning again. So that allows them to sort of uh, exist in environments where con conditions for growth might sort of come intermittently, uh, maybe in a strongly seasonal environment where it's frozen most of the time and it only briefly thaws out for part of the year. Uh, okay, so uh, another cool ability of microbes is uh, allelopathy and quorum sensing. Those two are some, somewhat connected and I'll, I'll talk about what allelopathy and quorum sensing are on the next slide because they're a little bit tricky to explain. So allelopathy has it's a word with two parts, allelo and pathy. So allelo means like other or neighbor, and pathy means harming. Uh, 
So allelopathy means harming your neighbor. And allelopathic microbes are microbes that produce some toxic chemicals that are harmful to other life around them and that may help them compete or uh, uh, it, it helps the uh, allelopathic organisms in some way, even though it hurts the organisms around them. So there's a lot of examples of allelopathic microbes in the marine environment. Uh, one example is from this uh, uh, Williams et al. paper, 2016 paper, where they found this uh, microbe, which you can actually see with your naked eye because it forms long filaments that end up looking like uh, tufts and, and clumps of seaweed, even though it's actually um, uh, filaments of uh, tiny uh, prokaryotic microbial cells. So uh, this type of cyanobacteria grows on reef and it creates this toxic uh, compound here that actually kills coral and that you know is bad for the coral but it benefits the microbe and because certain environmental factors including man-made pollution seem to be increasing the abundance of some of these allelopathic microbes we're really concerned that this may be a, one of the mechanisms by which we're losing coral on coral reefs is sort of the changes that we're making to the environment are favoring these allelopathic microbes which are then killering killing the the corals so that's a, an active area of marine ecology research. Okay, microbes are tiny, but in combination with many other microbes, they can uh, accomplish uh, monumental things. The thing is, if, when a microbe is just by itself in isolation, what it needs to do to survive might be pretty different from what it needs to do to survive when it's around a whole bunch of other microbes of its same type. And so microbes need to be able to know when they're in company versus when they're just by themselves because they might need to do different things under those different situations. So microbes have evolved this ability called quorum sensing, which is their ability to sense if they're around other microbes of the same type. Um, so it comes from the word quorum, which is a group of individuals that meets a certain threshold of size or density. Uh, oftentimes for meetings, uh, you need to have a certain percentage of the group members present at the meeting to constitute a quorum. Uh, and only if you have a quorum present are you allowed to vote on important matters, for example. So um, microbes uh, as well, there's certain things that they may not want to do unless they have uh, a lot of other microbes of their, their type around. So um, the, the way they accomplish this quorum sensing is by every microbe, like here's a microbe, it constantly puts out a little bit of some kind of chemical into the environment. Uh, and that chemical is called an autoinducer. And so if it's just one microbe in the environment that's putting this chemical out, the chemical will probably diffuse away and the microbe that put it out is never even gonna encounter that chemical again. But if there's a lot of microbes in the environment and they're all putting out those um, uh, autoinducer chemicals, then um, the concentration of those autoinducer chemicals is going to build up to the point that um, it's pretty obvious to the microbes because they can detect the abundance of these autoinducer chemicals in the environment that there's other bacteria around. And if they detect that there's a lot of other bacteria of their type around, then they will um, sometimes change their behavior. Like some types of microbes form what we call microbial mats, which are sort of like interconnected webs of uh, microbes that are connected by carbohydrate or, or protein strands. And that helps form like a, a film over the rock or something that helps them survive. And um, it's, it's a waste of their energy to sort of try to create a biofilm if they're not gonna be weaving it in with the microbes that are around them. But if there are enough microbes around them, then it makes sense for them to do th that group behavior. I'm trying to think of some analogy for human behavior where you know there's things that you wouldn't do normally as an individual, but if there's enough others around, you might get to the threshold where, oh, now I can, I should, I can do this. So something like, um, crowd surfing. This, this is something people do at, at concerts where um, 
you know, if there's a dense enough crowd, you can, and you're a performer, you can jump off the stage and like be carried along on the arms of the crowd. So um, that's great if you've got enough people and you can sense that there's enough people that you can jump out and then they'll carry you. But, um, you know, if you jumped out into a thin crowd, you'd probably just fall down and um, break your face. So um, th there's a lot of situations for humans where uh, whether a behavior is a good idea or not depends on what the density of other humans around you is. And um, it's the same for microbes. It's just different. Um, so the, an, an example here is there's uh, a type of microbe, Alvinibrivio, I'm not sure I pronounced the name right, but it's a type of microbe that has uh, bioluminescent capabilities, and it's uh, it lives symbiotically in um, cephalopods like this bobtailed squid, uh, Euprimia scolopes, and uh, there's no benefit to the microbe of um, bioluminescing when it's just one microbe by itself, but when it's in uh, uh, high density aggregation within the photophores, which are the light producing organs of the of the squid, um, then it turns on its bioluminescent uh, ability and um, uh, that, that benefits both the squid and the microbe because it's sort of, that's its role in the symbiotic relationship with the, the squid is to, to create light for the squid. Uh, and, and this interaction is described in more detail than I've just described here in the, in the paper if you want to learn more about the bioluminescent squid and the quorum sensing that goes on with the bacteria that produce the bioluminescence for the squid. All right. One of the most important ecosystem roles for microbes is breaking down organic matter, and that is accomplished by heterotrophic microbes. So heterotrophic microbes are sort of the decomposing microbes. They, they break down de organic matter, and um, so uh, sometimes I'll refer to that as breaking down organic matter. Sometimes I'll refer to that as decomposition, and I may also refer to it as remineralization. Those are all just synonyms for the same basic kind of breakdown process. Um, uh, remineralization is sometimes used because they call the uh, inorganic forms of these materials the mineral forms. So um, uh, you're sort of regenerating the mineral forms of the materials. That's why you call it remineralization. Uh, and these things are the raw ingredients of primary production. So these chemicals could go on to um, fuel primary production. And I'll just make a little flower here as an example of a primary producer. But of course, in the ocean, the primary producers would be, you know, phytoplankton and uh, seaweeds mostly, uh, not uh, not flowers like this. Uh, anyways, um, the uh, types of organic matter that can be broken down are a variety of things. So it could be wastes from organisms like poop, um, dead organisms or pieces of dead organisms, or dissolved organic matter. So uh, organic material that's already somewhat broken down that's um, dissolved in the water, uh, but can be broken down further into the uh, uh, inorganic components like carbon dioxide, dissolved inorganic phosphate, and dissolved inorganic nitrogen indicated in the ovals here. So um, this activity of heterotrophic microbes breaking down this waste into uh, the back into the raw ingredients of life, uh, I'm saying that it picks up the slack in the food chain because the food chain, the typical food chain that we've studied, it generates a lot of waste and that would just accumulate and not be usable again if it weren't for the microbes to um, sort of clean it up and, and reform it into this form that can be used by the primary producers. So I'm showing this example food chain from the secondary production lecture again, uh, where we talked about sort of the uh, input of energy from the sun to the primary producers and how the amount of available energy stored in biomass uh, decreases at, with every level in the food chain because those trophic transfers are not 100% um, efficient. So um, what's happening to that uh, energy and biomass that's not 100% transferred to the next trophic level? So that's kind of the clue to what's missing from this food chain. So if we sort of make room for what's missing from the food chain, um, and I'm sorry that my little picture is, is covering up part of it. Um, dissolved organic matter and particulate organic matter 
are a lot of the um, uh, stuff that's missing. So basically, every level in the food chain is sort of oozing out uh, dissolved and particulate organic matter and sort of creating this waste that doesn't make it up into the next level of the food chain, uh, but instead just kind of builds up in the water or on the bottom. So uh, this could be poop particles, it could be shed skins and shells, just anything that's not eaten um, or that's not absorbed fully uh, into the next trophic level uh, ends up in the dissolved and a lot of the stuff ends up in the, this, what we call a pool, um, and represent by a box in the diagram here, which is the dissolved and particulate organic matter, uh, DOM and POM. All right, so let me say a little more about dissolved organic matter and particulate organic matter. Dissolved organic matter isn't always visually apparent because it's dissolved. It's not like it's chunks. It's it's tiny little um, molecules that are so small that they're just dissolved in, in the water. They're not ever going to settle out or anything like that. But some types of dissolved organic matter are colored. They call it colored dissolved organic matter. You can actually see the way that it sort of stains the water. So in this picture of the Gulf of Mexico on the uh, um, left-hand side of the picture here, uh, you see that the water's more turquoise color. Uh, it does not have a whole lot of dissolved organic matter in it. Whereas this water in the estuary here uh, is almost black looking because it's full of tannins, a type of colored dissolved uh, organic matter. And you can really see at that visually that there's a high concentration of colored dissolved organic matter in these estuarine, in these black colored estuarine waters. So uh, organic matter includes these uh, large molecules leached off of plants, the tannins. It includes amino acids, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, secondary metabolites, basically any kind of chemicals of life that might be in a living cell that are then sort of released into the environment when that cell dies. And uh, those, those things are all sort of floating around in the water like a, like a soup. And there, there's a huge variety of other biomolecules uh, besides just the ones that I've listed here. And some of them may be relatively intact in the same form that they were in the living cell before that cell got ruptured and they released into the environment. Others might be in some stage of degradation or transformation. So it might be like a lipid that's partially decomposed or a carbohydrate that's broken down into smaller carbohydrates. Um, and and there's just a, an endlessly huge variety of um, types of the molecules of life that have now spilled out into the environment and are, and are floating around there as dissolved organic matter. Okay, particulate organic matter is a little easier to understand because you can actually see it, or at least you can see it under a microscope, or if you have a bright light shining against a dark background like in the picture here. Um, some oceanographers call particulate organic matter marine snow because in the bright lights of a submarine when you're in the deep sea it actually looks like snowflakes uh, drifting down as, as but it's, it's really these flecks of uh, tiny uh, fecal pellets and um, dead phytoplankton cells fish scales bits of jellyfish slime um, all kinds of uh, organic waste matter that's that's slowly falling down to the deep sea. Um, and there could be some large particles as well, like any dead animal floating in the ocean could be considered a particle of organic matter. It's just a large particle. Um, perhaps the biggest would be like a dead whale falling to the bottom of the ocean. You could actually consider that to be particulate organic matter. It's just a really, really large particle. Um, and uh, there's a, a video link and here, uh, which you can get from the downloadable PowerPoint that will uh, give a, a video that, that talks more about uh, a particular type of per particulate organic matter. These are some microscopic uh, pictures of organic matter that show a variety of mostly fecal pellets. So these are 
poop particles from different types of small uh, organisms that live in the surface waters of the ocean. Uh, they consume plankton and stuff and uh, partially digest it and their poop uh, is these pellets that, that sink to the bottom. Uh, we'll talk more about this in the deep sea lecture, but the way that organic matter is packaged into poop pellets by organisms can really affect the rate that it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So even though this seems like, well, why would you, you know, spend a career studying microscopic poop particles in the ocean? It turns out it's very important for sort of determining how that organic matter either sort of remineralizes in the surface waters and decomposes in the surface waters or sinks all the way to the bottom of the ocean, taking its carbon and nutrients with it. So um, the, the cycles of life in the ocean actually depend a lot on how fast poop sinks. Okay, so we have our, our food chain again here. We talked about how uh, all these levels of the food chain sort of uh, release a lot of slop in the form of particles of waste and uh, dissolved organic material that are waste. Something else that is released from every level in the food chain is um, dissolved inorganic nutrients and carbon dioxide. So all organisms have to respire. They break down organic matter back into carbon dioxide and water. and um, uh, they also break down organic matter that contains nitrogen and phosphorus and release nutrients to the water like ammonia. And so some of those nutrients are already remineralized uh, direct when, they're, when they're released from the organisms, like a fish in its urine, there's a lot of ammonia, which is already a form of the nutrient that can be absorbed again by um, phytoplankton. So that's what you see here. Um, that's why sometimes, you know, the wastewater from a fish farming operation uh, might be really high in nutrients and where that wastewater is released into the ocean it could stimulate the harmful algal blooms of an excessive amount of phytoplankton so sometimes this uh, um, uh, animal waste stimulating algae blooms is is too much and it's it's an undesirable thing okay uh, so that's showing the the organic the sort of the inorganic waste and um, carbon dioxide that are released from organisms then there's also the organic matter that's released from organisms and microbes have an important role because they can take the uh, organic waste that's not our that's not yet fully broken down into the form that plants can use so um, plants can't directly absorb dissolved and particulate organic matter they need it to be further broken down into the form of nutrients and CO2 before they can absorb it. So um, microbes are really good at doing that role. So they take these um, dissolved organic matter compounds and particles of organic matter, and they break them down further into forms that can be absorbed by the primary producers here, like these phytoplankton. Um, there is one small little blue arrow that you might have seen with the microbes that has them going up into the next link in the food chain here. It's, it's, and this represents the fact that microbes, because they are small little cells, they can be eaten by zooplankton. So just as um, phytoplankton can be eaten by zooplankton, which is represented by this orange arrow, uh, mic uh, heterotrophic microbes can also be eaten by zooplankton. And that's interesting because it means that some of this sort of like waste from the food chain that's ending up as dissolved in particulate organic matter can be sort of re-injected into the food chain as the microbes are eaten by um, slightly larger organisms. And that is part of what they call the microbial loop, something we'll talk about on the next few slides. Um, okay, so the pelagic part of the ocean is the, the open ocean, sort of the, the open waters of the ocean away from the bottom. And food webs in the pelagic ocean tend to be very microbially oriented, uh, in part because it's like a resource poor environment without a lot of nutrients. And some of the smallest organisms are the ones that are most efficient at absorbing nutrients from the environment when nutrients are scarce. So that's why in these low nutrient level pelagic environments, you have a food web where the, the very small microbes are an important basis of, of that food web. So the smallest types of um, 
zooplankton are, or sorry, the smallest types of plankton, they're, they're not zooplankton usually, are, are, are pycoplankton. They're, they're small prokaryotic organisms, including uh, photosynthetic cyanobacteria. And so the, the primary production in these pelagic food webs is often from these very, very tiny little uh, cyanobacteria. And these tiny, tiny cyanobacteria are hard for most life to feed on because there's tiny cells that are few and far between. Um, but other small organisms, heterotrophic nanoflagellates, which means small uh, eukaryotic uh, organisms like this, they can, because they're small themselves, make a living eating just the um, pycoplankton. So it's a dilute food source and it's in a viscous environment, so it's hard for them to get around and, and, and encounter the tiny pycoplankton cells that they need to eat. But they've evolved to be very efficient at sort of spiraling through the water with their flagella and uh, they can sort of search through a large volume of water relative to their body size in order to encounter the pycoplankton cells that they need to eat and live. Uh, the heterotrophic nanoflagellates in turn may be eaten by larger single-celled organisms. Uh, different types of protist microzooplankton like ciliates and dinoflagellates. Uh, so paramecium would be an example of a, a ciliate. Um, and some dinoflagellates are autotrophs, but others are heterotrophs that uh, will actually eat um, like heterotrophic nanoflagellates. Um, and so here we've got one, two, three levels in the food chain, and we still haven't gotten beyond the single-celled organisms. So it shows how microbially focused the food chains are in the pelagic environment. First three levels in the food chain, uh, and we're still um, in the microorganisms. The next level in the food chain would probably be larger zooplankton or small fishes that would eat these um, large uh, heterotrophic uh, microbes. Um, so we would finally be starting to get into some multicellular organisms, by the, but only by the fourth level in that uh, pelagic food chain. One of the consequences of the first three levels of the food chain in these pelagic food webs being so small and being single-celled organisms is that they, uh, if one level changes in abundance like the primary production increases, then the response by the um, next two levels is actually really fast because single-celled organisms can uh, reproduce rapidly when their uh, level of resources increases. So there's, that means that there's tight predator-prey coupling. Like as soon as there's any change in the prey abundance, the predator abundance uh, responds as well. Whereas if it's uh, larger multicellular organisms, the prey might increase, but since it sort of takes a while for the larger predators to um, respond to the increase in prey, the, they might not increase so fast. And there might be sort of a, like a delay or, or, or lag in the cycle. Whereas with these um, small organisms, when they comprise the first three levels of the food web, there's not usually much lag time between an increase in the tiniest ones and the increase in the next two levels. Uh, another consequence of the first couple levels of the food chain being these tiny microorganisms is that the overall pelagic food chains might have a lot of levels. So by the time you get up to some big organism like a shark or a tuna fish, um, you're at like the the sixth or seventh level of the uh, pelagic food chain. And um, that's really different from in a more coastal food chain where it might only be four levels uh, until you're at large fish. So a uh, big difference in the food chain length in the pelagic environment versus the um, uh, versus the, the coastal ocean environment. That's my attempt at drawing a tuna. All right, I mentioned the microbial loop uh, as sort of like this interesting way that um, bacteria, which are kind of picking up the slack in the food chain, end up uh, re-entering the food chain when they're eaten by zooplankton. And I wanted to explain that here. The diagram is a little bit complicated, but um, 
I want to explain it one step at a time. So we're first going to talk about the green arrows, which are the classic food web, and make sure that you understand that part of the diagram. And then we'll make sure that you understand the other parts of the diagram and what they mean here. So the classic food chain uh, is the one that you see in green. So it starts with nutrients like uh, phosphate and ammonia in the environment. And those nutrients are absorbed by um, phytoplankton, right? So it's your basic primary production process. You've got nutrients and sunlight, and then phytoplankton absorb those nutrients. And with the power of sunlight, they create organic matter and create more phytoplankton. And then the phytoplankton are eaten by zooplankton. And the zooplankton would then be eaten by small fishes or whatever is at the higher trophic level. So, um, so far, nothing weird about this. This is the food chain that you're familiar with from nutrients to plants to small animals to larger animals. Um, but one of the things that might be a little bit different about this food chain is that it's recognizing the fact that each of these levels in the food chain, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, the higher trophic levels, they all generate dissolved and particulate organic matter as waste. So as this food chain is going on, this pool here, the, the dissolved and particulate organic matter pool is building up. And so now there's all this organic matter building up in the environment that could be used by something. And that something is bacteria. Bacteria eat that waste. They eat the dissolved and particulate organic matter. Or eat is maybe a, a colloquial term, really. They're sort of like breaking it down and absorbing it. Um, and, you know, they're not perfectly efficient in that. They're kind of sloppy and they actually sort of regenerate some dissolved and particulate organic matter themselves. Um, but uh, th they do end up building up and, and creating more bacteria. And then those bacteria can become a food source for larger microorganisms like um, heterotrophic nanoflagellates, ciliates. Um, uh, and those uh, larger microorganisms can then be eaten by mesozooplankton. So what was sort of like the waste picker uppers from the main food chain is now re-entering the main food chain because it's being eaten by the zooplankton. Um, also, all the levels in the food chain uh, are sort of leaking out some nutrients. And so there's some like direct production of nutrients from every level in the food chain. Anyways, the fact that uh, the microbial loop, which is the, the red arrows, are um, sort of recapturing this dissolved and particulate organic matter and eventually passing it back up to the regular food chain uh, as it's eaten by the mesozooplankton means that production at higher trophic levels is going to be uh, increased. Uh, it, basically, there's more food available to the mesozooplankton since the bacteria have kind of picked up that slack and re-interjected re-inter it. So that's going to increase production at higher trophic levels. The other way that the microbial loop might increase production at higher trophic levels is by helping uh, regenerate uh, nutrients for primary production, meaning that primary production could increase um, through all that recycled nutrients. And that uh, will, of course, enhance the classic food chain and allow more production at higher trophic levels. So the microbial food, microbial loop is really like a win for the overall uh, productivity of higher trophic levels. So even though microbes are really important and they affect all of these uh, important processes like remineralization, primary production, uh, which eventually lead to the food chain that supports organisms that we're interested in and excited about, it's hard to study microbes. The main reason it's hard is because they're small. It's hard to see them. And even if you can see them in a microscope, they all kind of look like this. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to identify them, even though there's thousands of different species, uh, they look sort of like rods or, or balls. And eh, they, it's really hard to tell them apart just visually. Maybe with an electron microscope, you could do it, but uh, it, it's tough. Um, not only are they hard to identify to species, um, but they're, they're hard to isolate in culture. So Perhaps in some uh, biology classes you've taken, you've, you've cultured like uh, you swabbed your ear or something and rubbed it on a Petri dish and you see all the weird mold and, and bacteria colonies form. Um, that means that those microbes that were growing on the Petri dish were culturable. They're microbes that you can sort of like isolate and study because they grow on a Petri dish. Um, but a lot of the microbes in the ocean, 
don't grow in a petri dish and they we can't grow them in a lab in any way that we figured out so far so that's like actually a majority of the microbes in the ocean we can't isolate and grow in the lab so we know they're out there in the ocean because we can see them under the microscope we can detect their dna with genetic techniques um, but we don't really know what they're like or what they're doing because we can't uh, isolate them and, and study them individually um, and and so there's a lot of undescribed species that we might know only by their um, genetic signatures but we don't really know very well what they're doing in the ecosystem we can kind of only guess um, but this is a field of science that we're working on uh, at the institution that I uh, work at, Florida Gulf Coast University. We have a marine microbial ecologist who's working on this stuff all the time, and that's, that's true around the world as well. One of the things that marine microbiologists can do that is interesting is they can compare the microbial diversity of different areas with genetic techniques. So you can basically take a scoop of seawater um, amplify certain sections of the microbial genome and then sequence them and figure out how many different um, how many different variations there are in that genetic sequence and that tells you how many different types of microbe there are in that environment so you can basically count how many different types of microbe there are in, in that chunk of seawater uh, and then you could do that to compare different parts of the world so this chart here what it is is uh, a comparison of four different regions of the world two sort of really cold water regions at high latitudes the norwegian sea in the north atlantic and king george island in, near antarctica and then um, these two tropical stations one in the pacific and one in the atlantic and um, the hollow symbols here are the uh, high latitude areas near the North Pole and the South Pole and those have this many species about 47 species whereas the tropical environments indicated by the field symbols they have a lot more species so um, the x-axis here is species rank so basically the x-axis goes from zero to um, like a hundred and um, I can't quite see it because it's under my video there um, it goes from zero to over 100 and this is the number of species and then the abundance here is the number of individuals within that species so they call this a rank abundance curve because it shows the abundance of that organism um, based on its rank so basically you take you you order the species that you found from most abundant to least abundant which in this case is based on how much of their dna was present in the sample so um uh what you can if all the species were equally abundant the abundance would be just like a flat line from one to however many species there were um, but since the abundance swoops down like this what this actually means is that some of the species are really abundant and then some of the other species are um, present but they're not so abundant and so the shape of the abundance curve whether it's kind of like a gradual decrease or a really steep drop off um, tells you something about how skewed the uh, microbial community is there to a few species um, so what you see with the uh, cold water systems the ones with the hollow symbols is that there's a few really abundant species like the first 10 species uh, are really abundant and then um, the rest are not so abundant and then in the tropical community there are some species that are more abundant than others but then there's just like a lot of um, rare species so the overall diversity is higher in the tropics and there's a lot of kind of uh, rare species in the in the tropics uh, what that means for how the food webs might work in the cold water oceans and the tropical oceans depending on these sort of different compositions of the microbial community is something that people are still working on
Um, so if you're really interested in marine microbial ecology and you want to find some more ways that it links to the other levels of marine biology, like uh, the functioning of reef ecosystems, I recommend these two videos here, which talk about uh, how researchers are trying to understand coral diseases better and how coral defends itself against diseases, even though it lacks uh, this kind of immune system that uh, um, humans have. Um, it, there's a term holobiont, which means not just one uh, species, but all of the parasites and microbes and symbiotic things that live in association with that species, which we call the holobiont. So for a human, the holobiont includes like um, the gut bacteria and the skin bacteria that you have and the uh, you know, the yeasts in your skin, the mites in your eyebrows, and, and all of the organisms that live in association with your body, for better or worse. And uh, it turns out that for marine organisms like corals, there's also sort of a holobiont. There's many microorganisms of different kinds that live in and on the corals and affect the corals' uh, vulnerability or re resistance to disease. And we're just beginning to understand those kind of things by combining microbial ecology techniques with traditional reef ecology techniques and um, that's sort of a fruitful frontier of marine science. Okay so for the next part of this lecture we're, we're going to talk about how um, some, some marine chemistry issues that are related to primary production, secondary production, and microbial ecology. So we'll talk about uh, red field ratio and nutrient limitation, then we'll talk about forms of carbon in the ocean, how they relate to ocean acidification. So this uh, gentleman here is Alfred Redfield, an American uh, oceanographer. So Redfield at, was at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and was uh, interested in this type of biological science or chemistry and biolo biological science called stoichiometry. So stoichiometry is the uh, studying the quantitative relationships of elements in combination. So basically you look at a material and you figure out like what percent carbon is this material? What percent nitrogen is this material? What percent phosphorus is this material? Um, and you can get some insight into the uh, chemical makeup and, and chemical interactions that are important in the production of that material from those stoichiometric ratios and maybe how they change from the food sources or resource sources for the uh, that material and and things like that so um, redfield was making all these observations of the carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio in the ocean so in plankton that he would collect in a plankton net from different places and uh, using machines that could quantify the amount of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in the materials that he collected, he, he kept finding that they were in a, a real similar ratio, about 106 carbons to 16 nitrogens to one phosphorus was the ratio of, um, atomic ratio of these elements in the, um, all the organic materials he was looking at in the, in the ocean. And so he sort of wondered, why is it set at this particular ratio? Um, and that ratio is also sort of represented by this graph here where the bulk of the organic material is carbon and then nitrogen is the next biggest chunk and then phosphorus. So um, it turns out that to, to build a functioning living thing uh, with all of the lipids and nucleic acids and carbohydrates and uh, proteins made up of amino acids, you need chemicals in about this ratio. So you need a lot of carbon because it's the framework for all of the types of biomolecules that I just mentioned. You need a good bit of nitrogen because it is part of the um, amino acids that are essential to every protein. And you need some phosphorus, but not as much phosphorus. I mean, you have to have some phosphorus because it's in the um, nucleic acids, for example, but you, you don't need as much as you do nitrogen or carbon. Um, and there might be some variation from organism to organism in exactly how much carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus you need, but this general ratio is surprisingly consistent through different parts of the ocean. Um, and so 
the the reason we see this ratio uh, again is because uh, to to build a living thing, that's about the the ratios that you need. Like if you're baking a cake, you need mostly flour, but you also need a good amount of like sugar and eggs and uh, and milk and things like that. And so if you had, you're not going to find like a cake that's mostly made out of eggs. Otherwise, it would be an omelet um, or a flan or something. Any, anyways, to, to to make a uh, a living thing, you need mostly carbon, then nitrogen, then then phosphorus uh, in, in this uh, kind of Redfield ratio. And then that's reflected in the coefficients of the photosynthesis equation if we sort of do it quantitatively. So 106 carbon plus, uh, and, and include nutrients. So 106 carbon plus 16 uh, nitrate plus uh, a phosphate plus a, a lot of water um, and some uh, protons gives you uh, organic matter and oxygen. Uh, and then the reverse would be the equations for uh, respiration, uh, remineralization of organic matter by heterotrophic activity. So um, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus are the usual chemicals that are included in the Redfield ratio. But more recently, oceanographers, in recognition of the fact that iron is also an important nutrient in the ocean, even though it's needed in only small amounts, they've added iron to the Redfield ratio. And so instead of being 106 to 16 to 1, it's 106 to 16 to 1 to 0 0.01. And I think it's interesting to show that you know only 1 one hundredth the amount of iron is needed as you need of phosphorus. So uh, it's interesting that, an, that a nutrient that's needed in such small amounts can actually be really important for determining whether or not there's primary production going on in, in parts of the world that are iron limited. Okay, so uh, Redfield ratio, is it useful? Yes, it is. Uh, and the way we apply it is uh, according to this principle from economics that was articulated in the 19th century by um, a German named Liebig. And Liebig said growth is controlled not by the total amount of resources, but by the scarcest factor. So going back to that analogy of baking a cake that I said, so you could have like all the flour and milk and, and sugar you wanted, but if you didn't have eggs, you wouldn't be able to bake that cake. Um, and so the number of cakes that you could bake would be determined by whatever you had in least supply. So if you've got, you know, a, a ton of flour, that's great. But um, if you only have one egg, you're only going to be able to make like one one small cake. And full disclosure, I'm not a baker. I don't really know how many eggs you need to bake a cake or if you even need eggs to bake a cake. But I think you do. Uh, anyways, the, the point is that um, if you're if you're lacking one of the necessary ingredients, that is your limiting factor. Um, so uh, we can we can sort of measure the available nutrients in the environment and uh, compare them to the Redfield ratio to, to sort of figure out what's probably the limiting factor. So if um, the amount of iron in the environment is a lot less than 1% of the amount of phosphorus, then, then it's likely that iron could be a, a limiting ingredient. Um, so, so whatever one of the nutrients is like most off from the Redfield ratio, that's the one that's, that's probably the limiting factor. Um, there's also some what we call plasticity to the Redfield ratio in organisms. Like some plants, if they're living in an area where there's not enough nitrogen for them, they um, will end up having a somewhat lower carbon to nitrogen ratio than predicted by the Redfield ratio. Um, likewise, if they're in an area where there's like a lot of nutrient pollution, there's an excessive amount of nitrogen and phosphorus, um, then they might have uh, actually a lower relative ratio of carbon to nitrogen and phosphorus because they're sort of um, taking up some of that extra car uh, nitrogen and phosphorus because they can. So um, there, there can be deviations from the Redfield ratio that tell you if something is maybe limited or in excess. And of course, real world factors complicate things. There might be some slight differences from the Redfield ratio, depending on what particular type of um, organism you're looking at and um, which nutrient is limiting can be a little complicated by things like co-limitation and some of the other things that we talked about in the primary production lecture. Uh, but just as, as a general, to get a general idea of what nutrient is, is most likely to be limiting the Redfield ratio is, is useful.
All right, so one thing that's not usually a limiting nutrient uh, in the ocean is carbon. So carbon is part of the red field ratio, which of course is the carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Um, but usually marine primate producers can get plenty of carbon. That's because there's there's a lot of carbon in, in the ocean. Um, the But carbon in the ocean does, uh, the, the forms of carbon in the ocean can vary, and that's what, where carbon in the ocean gets interesting. Because even though there's a lot of carbon in the ocean, it's really unevenly distributed between different forms of carbon. So the two basic classes of carbon in the ocean are inorganic carbon and organic carbon. So inorganic carbon would be like small, simple molecules um, with just like one carbon. So uh, that could be dissolved inorganic carbon, um, like carbon dioxide, this is CO2, and uh, carbonates, like this is uh, CO3, two minus. Um, the, those would be examples of dissolved inorganic carbon, DIC. Um, and this is uh, one the, with the three O's here, that one's called carbonate. Um, and then there's organic carbon. So organic carbon would be the usually larger, more complex molecules. This molecule here is methane. Um, methane, CH4, some people consider it to be a very small form of organic carbon. Other people consider it to be an inorganic form, um, but uh, it's an example of a, a hydrocarbon. Uh, and, you know, if it was a longer chain hydrocarbon like propane or um, uh, ethane or heptane or whatever, if, if it was a larger, longer hydrocarbon change, then you would definitely consider it to be uh, an organic molecule. Uh, anyways, um, organic molecules include all of the stuff in living things, like from a bacteria to a uh, whale, that's all organic carbon. And then the wastes and of the living things like poop would be organic carbon. And dead living things like the salmon carcass would also be uh, organic carbon. Um, so those uh, living and dead things would be examples of particulate organic carbon but also the chemicals from those things when they dissolve and leach into the water would be dissolved organic carbon and those are also important. Um, so for particulate organic carbon, I made a distinction between living things, which are particles, and dead things, which would be called detrital uh, organic matter. For dissolved organic matter, we can distinguish between labile and refractory organic matter. Labile means chemicals that are easily uh, absorbed or, and used by uh, like bacteria. And refractory means types of molecules that don't break down easily and uh, might just sort of persist in the environment for a long time before they finally break down. All right. There's much more inorganic carbon in the ocean than there is or, organic carbon, and as much and within the organic carbon pool, there's much more dissolved organic carbon than particulate organic carbon. This is kind of non-intuitive because, like particles of organic matter, you can actually see them. Like you see a whale, and it's like, wow, that is a big chunk of carbon. That whale, or a big pile of seaweed, that seems like a lot of carbon. Um, but relative to the amount of dissolved uh, or inorganic and organic carbon, the amount of carbon that's actually in particle form is tiny. So this is not a tiny number, but it's tiny in comparison to the amount of dissolved organic carbon. And the amount of dissolved organic carbon is tiny in comparison to the amount of dissolved inorganic carbon. Um, so it's, it's sort of interesting, like just to think about how much carbon there is on planet Earth and in our oceans at one time, and then only a small fraction of that is actually in the bodies of living things. So let's talk about that large amount of dissolved inorganic carbon that is not in the bodies of living things yet, and and what its role is in the ocean. So that's that's CO2 mostly, and and some chemicals related to CO2. So CO2, carbon dioxide, we know that it exists in the atmosphere and the ocean, um, and it can sort of go back and forth between the atmosphere and the ocean. So uh, at the surface of the ocean, you've got carbon dioxide above the surface of the ocean and carbon dioxide dissolved within the ocean. Um, and 
carbon dioxide can leave the ocean or can can go back into the ocean um, to be you know carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere or aqueous carbon dioxide abbreviated you know aq in the ocean and so this is just sort of like uh fizzing out into the atmosphere or dissolving into the ocean. And it's a back and forth reaction, a back and forth reaction they, they call an, an equilibrium. Uh, and this process of getting into the atmosphere, into the ocean, they call diffusion. Um, uh, and some people call this diffusion-based process the, the solubility pump because carbon dioxide is soluble in the ocean and so it'll go into the ocean until the point that the ocean is saturated with carbon dioxide and then um, they it may start leaching out of the ocean uh, anyways um, carbon dioxide will diffuse into whatever area where the carbon dioxide concentration is lower so if there happens to be a low concentration of carbon dioxide in the surface waters of the ocean more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere will come down into the ocean until that balances it out uh, like op opposite effect if the ocean is saturated in carbon dioxide for some reason then the carbon dioxide will bubble out of the ocean back into the atmosphere so um, it's just uh, diffusion based on wherever whichever compartment the atmosphere of the ocean uh, has a lower amount of carbon dioxide at any one time, that's where the, the carbon dioxide will go. Um, there's some factors that affect how much carbon dioxide can dissolve in the ocean. Temperature is one of those factors, so cold water holds more carbon dioxide. When water gets cold in the polar areas of the earth, uh, it can absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. And then also because it's cold, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And that's one of the ways that carbon dioxide is absorbed from the atmosphere into the ocean um, through that so-called solubility pump. But of course, living things use carbon dioxide as we discussed in the primary production lecture. Um, and the absorption of carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis by phytoplankton in the surface ocean, it turns out to be really important in the global carbon cycle. Um, one of the things that happens when the phytoplankton in the surface ocean absorb carbon dioxide is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the water around them goes down. And that means that uh, more carbon dioxide can now dissolve in the surface ocean water. So, so it's sort of like the phytoplankton reduce the concentration in the water and then that makes more room for carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to dissolve into the water. And that's process repeats and it's sort of like it's pumping carbon dioxide into the ocean and storing it in the phytoplankton um, and you know then different things can happen the phytoplankton might sink to the bottom of the ocean and take the carbon with them or the phytoplankton might die and decompose and release the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere um, so a lot a lot of things can happen there and of course as you might imagine the solubility pump and the biological pump uh, affect each other and there, another thing that affects the absorption of carbon dioxide by the ocean is the fact that carbon dioxide in water um, can undergo a reaction with water. And we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, maybe two slides from now, the reaction between carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so this is a visual depiction of what I was just talking about on the last slide. You can see here the solubility pump where carbon dioxide is soluble in the ocean so it dissolves into the ocean um, but if there's a high amount of carbon dioxide in the ocean uh, it can also diffuse back into the atmosphere and biology affects this as well because photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and turns it into organic carbon and that sort of decreases the carbon dioxide concentration and allows more carbon dioxide to go into the ocean. Organic carbon in the ocean can um, sort of be decomposed back into carbon dioxide, which may enter the atmosphere again. Uh, organic carbon in the ocean can also sink to the bottom of the ocean uh, before it decomposes. And then it won't be until that deep water is upwelled to the surface that that carbon dioxide can off gas or the organic carbon might actually sink into the seafloor and uh, remain there and eventually become like uh, oil and natural gas deposits. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things that can happen with carbon dioxide in the ocean is the moral of this story. All right, so I mentioned that carbon dioxide doesn't just dissolve in the ocean and stay in the form of carbon dioxide it can be absorbed by living organisms and another thing that it can do is it can react with water so carbon dioxide plus h2o 
the reaction forms carbonic acid, CO3H2. So, um, or H2CO3, uh, which we which call carbonic acid. So an acid is a chemical that when you put it in water, it can give off um, H pluses. And you can, you may already see by looking at this chemical formula, there's two H's here on this um, carbonic acid that could easily dissociate from the rest of the molecule and increase the concentration of H pluses in the water. And of course, acidity is a measure. Um, it's actually the negative log of the uh, H plus concentration. So um, uh, this chemical is an acid which will release H pluses into the water and make it more acidic. So it's weird. Um, carbon dioxide itself doesn't have any hydrogens on it. And H2O is not really an acid. It's like a neutral compound. But when you put the two together, they form something that is an acid. So if people are like, how can car carbon dioxide make the ocean more acidic? You say like, well, first and there's a reaction between carbon dioxide and water, and that makes an acid. And then that acid is what makes the ocean more acidic. Um, so here's just a, a diagram of the uh, equilibrium between uh, H2CO3 uh, to um, HCO3 minus to um, CO3 to minus. Um, and you can see that with this first dissociation, one H plus is lost, and the second dissociation, um, both H pluses are lost uh, and the H plus concentration in the water increases. Um, this is called carbonic acid. This is called bicarbonate and this is called carbonate. Um, so those are the names that I've written here. Carbonate, bicarbonate, and carbonic acid. It's hard to get the name straight. In particular, bicarbonate always confuses me. But um, you'll, you'll just have to remember which names go with which of these uh, ions here. Uh, okay, so putting this all together, there's this multi-stage process that leads to ocean acidification. The first is carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere dissolving into the ocean. The second is the reaction between the carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean and water, which creates carbonic acid. And the um, third, fourth, and fifth are sort of the dissociations of carbonic acid into these uh, ionized forms um, releasing uh, protons, H pluses, which are what makes the water more acidic because pH, which is a measure of acidity, is equal to the negative log base 10 of uh, the concentration of protons in the water. Uh, all right, so uh, as the water gets more acidic, the equilibrium between the um, different forms of dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean shifts. So this CO2 uh, actually refers to both CO2 and H2CO3. So um, if the water is really acidic, then there's already a lot of protons in the water and the protons will tend not to dissociate from the carbonic acid. And so most of the organic carbon in the ocean will be in this form of H2CO3. If the water is really basic, then uh, the H pluses on the carbonic acid are easily pulled off and you end up with most of the carbon being in the form of CO3 to minus. And then at the just slightly basic uh, pH approximately 8.1, or 8.2 of the oceans today, this intermediate form of carbon, dissolved inorganic carbon, bicarbonate, uh, tends to be the most abundant compound. Um, what's interesting is we're at this pH that the ocean is at today, uh, uh, a little over pH 8. Um, if there was a just a slight decrease in pH from the levels that we're at now, there would actually be a pretty steep decrease in the amount of carbonate available. And that is a big deal because a little shift in pH um, 
wouldn't change the amount of bicarbonate very much because bicarbonate is already pretty dominant, but it would reduce the already low amount of um, carbonate, and that, that could be consequential. Um, the reason that uh, it's a big deal if we reduce the amount of carbonate is that carbonate is part of this really important ionic compound, calcium carbonate, uh, that forms the shells and skeletons of many marine organisms. So um, what are these marine organisms here? You might recognize uh, this one here, which is a type of coral. This is a, a cropper of cervicornis, the um, staghorn coral found in the Caribbean. Uh, you probably recognize this uh, organism here, which is a scallop shell uh, type of bivalve mollusk that has a calcium carbonate shell. Um, this organism you might remember from our phytoplankton lecture. It's a coccolithophore, so it's a single cell eukaryotic protist that's uh, plant-like and has uh, calcium carbonate plates that, that cover its body. And um, you probably are not going to recognize this organism here. This is a foraminifer, so it's a type of heterotrophic protist that has a calcium carbonate shell. And then this bushy red thing here is a type of uh, coralline algae. So it's a type of red seaweed that actually has calcium carbonate in it for protection and, and structure. Uh, so um, really different organisms here. Um, there's protists, there's bivalves, there's cnidarians, there's um, plants, uh, but all of these organisms uh, have calcium carbonate forming their shell or skeletal elements. So it's, it's really important for marine life. Um, the thing about calcium carbonate is you know, it's formed from these two chemicals that are commonly dissolved in the water, carbonate, which is one of these forms of dissolved inorganic carbon, uh, and also calcium, which is a, a common ion in the ocean. And under some conditions, uh, the ionic compound that they form is stable. It will not dissolve back into the separate ions. But under other conditions, which can be found in the ocean, uh, it's unstable and it will dissolve back into the Ca2 plus, CO3 2 minus ions. Uh, some of the conditions that cause calcium carbonate to break up are the high pressure of deep water and uh, the acidic environment of, of acidic water. So um, deep in the ocean and in more acidic parts of the ocean, calcium carbonate is not stable, it dissolves. Whereas in other parts of the ocean, calcium carbonate is stable and it accumulates and forms coral reefs and things like that. Um, and so the balance of uh, pH and stuff in the water is really, really important to whether the calcium carbonate shells and skeletons of organisms are stable or not. So there's a bunch of terms on this slide that relate to calcium carbonate and its stability. And so we'll just go through these one by one and, and try to get you to understand them. So uh, one, the first term here is the saturation horizon. So that because the solubility of calcium carbonate is affected by depth and pressure, if you as you go deeper, you eventually hit some level where the calcium carbonate will start to dissolve. And that is called the saturation horizon. And then there's a level a little bit deeper than that where um, the solubility of calcium carbonate starts to really increase. So not only is it dissolving a little bit, but it's dissolving fast. Uh, and they call that the lysocline. So it's like this depth zone of abruptly increasing solubility of calcium carbonate. Um, another term related to calcium carbonate is calcification. That's the rate that calcium carbonate is produced. So calcification could be sort of like a natural chemical process that just where, you know, there's the water is saturated with calcium carbon and, and carbonate, and it just naturally precipitates and crystallizes. Um, but there's also sort of like calcification that's mediated by living things. So like the coral is actively producing calcium carbonate, like it's got uh, biomolecular mechanisms of grabbing the calcium ions and the carbonate ions and mashing them together and forming these uh, uh, crystal structures of calcium carbonate. Uh, so the rate of formation of the solid form of calcium carbonate is affected by the availability of the calcium and the carbonate. The availability of the calcium doesn't really change that much, but the availability of the carbonate, the concentration of the carbonate does change a lot because it's affected by pH. Uh, 
So in an acidic environment with low pH, there's not very uh, there, there's a low concentration of calcium carbonate, and so the rate of formation of calcium carbonate is low. Um, another thing that comes into play is what form uh, of solid mineral the calcium carbonate is. It can be so some organisms create this form of calcium carbonate called calcite, which is more resistant to dissolving, and other marine organisms create aragonite, which is maybe a, a little easier to, for them to create in some ways, but it dissolves more easily. So um, the level of saturation at which calci calcite dissolves at is um, different than the one at which aragonite dissolves at. Uh, okay, and then this final term here, compensation depth. That's the rate where the deposition of calcium carbonate to the seafloor equals the rate of dissolution. So, um, and of course, it's different for calcite versus aragonite because those two things are dissolve at different depths. Like aragonite dissolves in shallower water than calcite dissolves in. Um, so you can kind of think of it like uh, the snow line in the mountains. I, I know for students who live in Florida, you've probably never seen anything like this, but in areas where uh, it's cold and there are mountains, you can oftentimes see a snow line on the mountains where um, above the snow line, uh, snow is falling fast enough and the weather's cold enough that snow and ice accumulate on the ground and pile up. And below the snow line, um, it's either too warm or the snow's not falling fast enough and, and there's dissolution of the snow. So uh, it's, it's similar in the ocean. So the calcium carbonate remains of organisms are falling down from the surface waters like snowflakes. And if they land in an area where the calcium carbonate is not dissolving fast, they may pile up and you end up with a lot of calcium carbonate shells and skeletons building up on the bottom. Um, but if those particles fall to an area where they're dissolving rapidly, it's sort of as if they were in snowflakes in warm weather and they're not going to pile up on the bottom unless they're falling at a really rapid rate that's exceeding the rate that they're dissolving. So this diagram here shows some of these things that we've been talking about in terms of calcium carbonate. And it's a really juicy graph, but it's also kind of confusing because they try to put so many things together on this one graph. And so if you just try to like look at it and understand it all in a second, you would fail. Uh, so I'm going to try to explain the parts of this graph one bit at a time, and then maybe it'll make more sense. So if you ever are coming up on a graph and reading a paper or something like this was a paper published in the science journal nature um, this graph came from that paper uh, the first thing you would want to do would be look at the gr uh, axes on the graph and what they represent so let's do the y-axis first because that one makes sense um, it's water depth in kilometers so you're going from depth zero which is the surface of the ocean and all the way down to over six kilometers deep, which is uh, 6,000 meters deep. That's um, the, the typical depth of the seafloor is about um, uh, 3,800 meters deep. So we're talking about really deep down when we're talking about the 6,000 meters deep. Um, okay, now let's look at this uh, orange thing that they've graphed here, cumulative ocean floor hypsometry. You've probably never seen the word hypsometry before, um, but what this uh, means is basically how much of the world's uh, ocean floor is at that depth or shallower, and it's a percent. So the let's let's pick a depth here. This is 500 meters here between the zero kilometer and the one kilometer. Um, so at 500 meters depth. If we trace this line up to here, we can see that it intersects, uh, it looks like about 14%. So what this means is that 14% of the Earth's seafloor is 500 meters depth or lower. Uh, if we went down to um, like uh, 4,000 meters depth, we follow that over, we can see that 50% uh, or about 50% of the uh, world's ocean is 
4,000 meters deep or shallower. And then by the time we get to 5,000 meters depth, uh, we've got almost 80% of the world's ocean is 5,000 meters depth or less. 6,000 meters depth, oh, I can't quite see because my uh, video is in the way, but almost all of the ocean is um, 6,000 meters deep or less. And only a tiny little bit of the ocean, like the deep trenches, would be deeper than 6,000 meters. Uh, and once you account for that, you've accounted for the entire 100% of the um, area of seafloor. So that's what um, hypsometry means. It basically just like how much of the world's oceans is like within that depth zone or, or deeper. Um, uh, let's see, what else uh, does this graph show? Um, what, one of the things that it shows uh, is the calcite saturation horizon. So that's a relatively easy thing to study here. So basically above this line, calcite uh, will tend to be in solid form and it can actually crystallize. The water is said to be saturated with respect to calcium carbonate. And so calcite crystals can form easily and, and shells and skeletons of marine organisms are not gonna dissolve. So basically if you're shallower than about uh, 1500 meters deep, um, your shells or skeletons are safe. If you are deeper than um, 1.5 kilometers, 1500 meters, then you start to get into this lysocline area where the solubility of um, calcium carbonate uh, increases. And for a while, uh, you can still have uh, a good bit of ca calcium carbonate. This dotted line is the percent, percent of the sediment material that has uh, calcium carbonate in it. So it's still pretty high until you get uh, um, fairly deep around 3,000 to 4,000 meters deep, and then it drops off pretty rapidly. So the sediments uh, in shallow to moderately deep depths of the oceans are full of calcium carbonate because it doesn't dissolve very rapidly. But then as you get to the sediments deeper down, um, uh, there's very little calcium carbonate in the deep sea sediments because it dissolves faster than it accumulates. And that threshold, uh, the calci calcite compensation depth, where the calcium carbonate in the sediment is dissolving faster than it accumulates, is looks like it's about 4,500 meters in this depth, in this um, thing here. Uh, and then the carbonate accumulation rate is shown here. So basically, by the time you get to 4,500 meters deep, you can see on the blue line that basically there's no more accumulation of calcium carbonate. It's just dissolving so much faster than it's raining down that it's not building up. So uh, why explain this? Well, one, one of the concerns here is because all these things are affected by uh, the acidity of the ocean, the pH of the ocean. As the ocean pH uh, decreases, which means that the ocean is becoming more acidic, then um, all these uh, things that are in the deep ocean are going to shift shallower. So basically the zone where calcium carbonate starts dissolving is going to move closer to the surface. And if you're like a, a deep sea reef or something that's living um, at uh, maybe 1,000 or 1,300 meters deep, if the calcite saturation horizon moves up so that you're now below the calcite saturation horizon because the ocean got more acidic, now instead of being able to sustain your calcium carbonate structures, you're going to start dissolving. Okay, so to summarize the effects of ocean acidification, as the ocean becomes more acidic, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the ocean increases. The concentration of uh, protons in the ocean, which is what acidity is. Uh, based on increases, and the concentration of bicarbonate uh, increases. But the concentration of carbonate, CO3 2 minus, decreases and the pH goes down because the pH is the negative log of the uh, proton concentration. The calcification rate slows down, which is sort of like the rate of production of calcium carbonate, so you're not making solid shell and skeleton is fast uh, in an acidic environment. And the calcium carbonate that's already made becomes more soluble, more likely to dissolve. The lysocline and the calcium carbonate and the carbonate compensation depth gets shallower. So the depth in the ocean at which calcium carbonate is stable is now restricted to the shallower waters, uh, which is a threat to things like deep sea reefs.
So the final thing that I want to pose to you is a, a question based on pH and its relationship to um, the actual concentration of protons in the water. So I've given you three values of pH. pH 8.2, which is the historical average pH of the oceans um, before the Industrial Revolution, which was the time that humans began burning fossil fuels and uh, cutting down tropical forests at a, at a rapid rate and increasing the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Before the Industrial Revolution, the pH was about 8.2. Now, after you know the rapid expansion of the human population and the increase in fossil fuel burning and destruction of rainforests that release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide has gotten to the oceans and uh, lowered the pH to about 8.1. So we've changed one unit of pH. And projecting from the trends that we have going on now, the increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the increasing um, uh, absorption of carbon dioxide by the oceans. We expect by the end of the 21st century that uh, pH of the ocean will be about 7.8. So um, just looking at these numbers like 8.2 to 7.8, it doesn't seem like that's a very big deal. I mean, it's just 0.4 difference in pH. Uh, both these numbers round to eight. They're both above pH seven, which means technically basic. So sometimes people look at these numbers and they're like, eh, ocean acidification is no big deal. It's just like a couple percent change in the, in the pH of the ocean. Um, but what I want you to do is make a graph of the actual H plus concentration associated with these different pH levels. Um, for for the these different levels, so um, it'll be a graph like this with um, the pH levels of the three different years as columns on the graph. So uh, pH 8.2, the original um, value, the current value pH 8.1, and the future projected value pH 7.8 here. And you're going to have bars um, for each of these values. I'm going to make them all the same height because I don't want to reveal the answer to you what it's going to be. Um, and then you'll have an axis which goes from 0 to um, some some number here. Whatever your, your highest proton concentration is, set that scale based on that. And then divide the axes into... Uh, equal sized units so that you can fairly represent the concentrations here. I think you'll be kind of surprised at, uh, at what you find. All right.